Christ is risen. I'm Sister Vasa, obviously, and I'm having my coffee here in Vienna, in Austria. It is now the second week after Easter, and if you have been watching this show, you know that last week we were trying to help our Greek costume designer, Emilios, find a job because Emilios wants to marry our beautiful Polish set designer, Anka, and she won't marry him until he proves that he can hold a decent job and make an honest living. You see, she says that Emilios has promised to change many times in the past, but then disappointed her. I don't know the details. Anyway, the good news is that we did find Emilios a job at the local Burgtheater, actually, where he worked once before, that's actually where he met Anka, but that's a long story. Anyway, he's trying very hard, and at the end of each workday, he brings Anka flowers, and she gives them to me. So, I've been getting lots of flowers this week. You know, for now, I, I do think that Anka will come around, but for now, she says that she's heard it all before, and that it's like deja vu. Did that voice inside you say, I've heard it all before? It's like deja vu all over again. Bringing flowers to someone you love might seem wasteful, especially if they don't react to this act of love. But if they do love you back, the flowers will wilt very soon, so a practical person would call it a waste of money in any event. This Sunday, on the second Sunday after Easter, we celebrate the mirror-bearing women and Joseph of Arimathea, the people who showed such acts of love to Christ when they could expect nothing from him in return. The women followed him in the final hours after his arrest. They stayed by his side during his death on the cross. And together with two men, one named Nicodemus and the other Joseph of Arimathea, who donated, donated his new tomb for the burial of Christ's body, they were there at his burial. And on early Sunday morning, these women came to the tomb with expensive myrrh. This is a resin that comes from trees that grow in the Middle East or in North Africa, and it has a unique aroma. They came with this myrrh to anoint his body. They could not do this on Saturday, you see, because it was the Sabbath, so they came as soon as possible, early Sunday morning, as soon as the Sabbath had passed. And, as most of you will know, they found the tomb empty, and an angel told them that Christ had risen, and commanded them to tell the apostles. The risen Christ himself appeared to Mary Magdalene and another Mary at the empty tomb, according to the Gospel of Matthew, and also ordered Mary to go tell the disciples he has risen. For this reason, the mirror-bearing women are sometimes called the apostles to the apostles. However, you know that the disciples did not believe the testimony of the women. We don't have time, unfortunately, to discuss the somewhat complicated and sometimes even contradictory accounts of the Gospels about Christ's post-resurrectional appearances. Let me just note that they are complicated and they are partly contradictory, so it's hard to establish the exact sequence of events. Why is this so? because it's a true story, because it really happened, and reality is complicated. Fairy tales are simple, but eyewitness accounts of something that really happened are never simple, as you might know. Eyewitnesses of one and the same event will rarely, if ever, be entirely the same. Today, we will select just one gospel account concerning the resurrection and concentrate on just a few of its aspects. This is what we read in the Gospel of Mark. Now, when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. 
After that, he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country, that is, to Luke and Cleopas, on the road to Emmaus. And they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. So, initially, Christ wanted the message of the resurrection to be spread by the testimony of eyewitnesses, first the women and some of the men. He wants the disciples to trust this testimony, but they don't take their word for it. The disciples didn't believe this testimony, thinking, as one gospel says, that the women fabricated idle tales. Note that in the Jewish and Greco-Roman worlds, women were not considered credible witnesses, and their testimony was rarely admissible in any court of law. In any event, in this case, Christ himself ultimately demonstrated that the women had been right, and that the apostles were wrong. Let's focus on two moments in this story. One, being right, as the women were right, but were not believed by the apostles, who took the women's words to be idle tales. And two, on leaving it to God, to finally convince the apostles that the women's testimony was true. Because, as we saw above, it was Christ himself who finally backed up the women's story. And we don't hear anything about the women's reaction to not being believed, whether they were insulted or whether they persisted in trying to convince the apostles. In any case, we know that the women did carry on as before, as members of the community of Christ's followers, and also continued to carry the message of Christ's resurrection, because some of them, like Mary Magdalene, who is called equal to the apostles, participated in the evangelical labors of the apostles after Pentecost. Now, we may also sometimes find ourselves in the awkward position of being right for some objective reason, for example, on topics we perhaps studied, and know well, or on the basis of extensive experience in certain areas, but others might nonetheless not believe us, or disagree with us on the basis perhaps of prejudice, ignorance, or simply a disregard for our opinion. There are sometimes divisive issues, even within our church community, like political issues, or women's issues, in which we might find ourselves in disagreement with church pastors. What? It does happen. Don't be upset that I mentioned the elephant in the room. This can also happen in our other personal relationships, that we might know we are right for some objective reason, that we are speaking the truth, and yet we are not believed or not taken seriously by another person. In this situation, our reaction to this attitude of the other person could potentially destroy our relationship or lead us to bitterness or even hatred, because we might forget our focus on God. To leave it to God, that is. But the fact is, we should remind ourselves that God is the supreme judge of justice and truth in any event, and when we keep our focus on Him, in daily prayer and hand over our entire being on a daily basis into his hands. His grace does preserve our relationships and our convictions in a proper spirit that will be constructive rather than destructive for us and those we love. So I'm not saying abandon your convictions, not at all, but let's concentrate on right being rather than being right, and take it easy and leave the things we cannot control, like the convictions of others, in the hands of God. Take it easy, take it easy. That's it for today, ladies and gentlemen. Christ is risen. Thank you.